penso che venite in giro vi potete mettere anche più avanti se non lo stream ottimo with a bunch of uh, mathematicians, philosophers, and computer scientists, and um, we sit around and think uh, about the future of machine intelligence, among other things. Some people think that some of these things are sort of science fiction, far out there, crazy. But I like to say, okay, let's look at the modern human condition. This is the normal way for things to be. But um, if we think about it, we are actually recently arrived guests on this planet. The human species, well, like, think about if the world like, was created, Earth was created one year ago, the human species uh, would be 10 minutes old. The industrial era started two seconds ago. Another way to look at this is to think of world GDP over the last 10,000 years. I've actually taken the trouble to plot this for you in a graph. It looks like this. It's a curious shape for a normal condition. I sure wouldn't want to sit on it. Now, let's ask ourselves, what is the cause of this current anomaly? Some people would say it's technology. Now, it's true. Um, technology has accumulated through human history. Uh, and right now, technology advances extremely rapidly. That is the approximate cause. That's why we are currently so very productive. Um, but I like to think back further to the ultimate cause. Um, look at these two highly distinguished gentlemen. We have Kanzi, 
He's mastered 200 lexical tokens. An incredible feat. And Ed Witten unleashed the second superstring revolution. If we look under the hood, this is what we find. Basically the same thing. Right? One is a little larger. It maybe also has a few tricks in the exact way it's wired. These invisible differences cannot be too complicated, however, because there have only, only been 250,000 generations since our last common ancestor, and we know that complicated mechanisms take a long time to evolve. So, a bunch of relatively minor changes take us from Kanzi to Witten, from broken off tree branches to intercontinental ballistic missiles. So this then seems pretty obvious that everything we've achieved, pretty much, and everything we care about <coughs> depends, crucially, on some relatively minor changes that made the human mind. And the corollary, of course, is that any further changes that could significantly change the substrate of thinking could have potentially enormous consequences. Some of my colleagues think we are on the verge of something that could cause a profound change in that substrate, and that is machine superintelligence. Like, artificial intelligence used to be about putting commands in a box. You would have human programmers that would painstakingly handcraft knowledge items. You build up these expert systems, and they were kind of useful for some purposes, but they were very brittle. They, you couldn't scale them. Basically, you got out only what you put in. Since then, a paradigm shift has taken place in the field of artificial intelligence. Today, the action is really around machine learning. So rather than handcrafting knowledge representations and, and features, we create uh, algorithms that learn often from raw perceptual data. Uh, basically the same thing that the human infant does. The result is AI that is not limited to one domain. The same system can learn to translate between any pairs of languages. Or learn to play any computer game at the uh, Atari console. Now of course, AI is still nowhere near having the same powerful cross-domain ability to learn and plan as a human being has, Cortex still has some algorithmic tricks that we don't yet know how to match in machines. But so the question is, how far are we from being able to match those tricks? A couple of years ago, we did a survey of some of the world's leading AI experts to, to see what they think. And one of the questions we asked was, by which year do you think there is a 50% probability that we will have achieved human level machine intelligence? We defined human level here, as the ability to perform almost any job, at least as well as an adult human, so real human level, not just within some limited domain. And the median answer was 2040 or 2050, depending on precisely which group of experts we ask. Information processing in machine substrate lies far outside the limits in biological tissue. This comes down to physics. The biological neuron fires maybe at 200 hertz, 200 times a second. Even a present-day transistor operates at a gigahertz. Neurons propagate slowly in axons, 100 meters per second tops. But in computers, signals can travel at the speed of light. There are also size limitations, like a human, has to fit, a human brain has to fit inside a cranium, but a computer can be the size of a warehouse or a large so the potential for superintelligence kind of lies dormant in matter. Much like the power of the atom lies dormant uh, throughout human history, patiently waiting there until 1945. In this century, scientists may learn to awaken the power of artificial intelligence. And I think we might then see an intelligence explosion. Now most people, when they think about what is smart and what is dumb, I think have in mind a picture roughly like this. So at one end we have sort of the village idiot, and then far over at the other side we have Ed Witten or Albert Einstein, whoever your favorite sort of guru is. But I think that from the point of view of artificial intelligence, the true picture is actually probably more like this. AI starts out at this point here, at zero intelligence, and then after many, many years of really hard work, maybe eventually we get to mouse-level artificial intelligence, something that can navigate cluttered environments as well as a mouse can. And then, after many, many more years of really hard work, lots of investment, maybe
maybe eventually we get to chimpanzee level artificial intelligence. And then, after even more years of really, really hard work, we get to village idiot artificial intelligence. And a few moments later, we are beyond Ed Witten. The train doesn't stop at Humanville Station. It's likely rather to swoosh right by. Now, this has profound implications, particularly when it comes to questions of power. For example, chimpanzees are strong. Pound for pound, a chimpanzee is about twice as strong as a fit human male. And yet, the fate of Kanzi and his pals now depends a lot more on what we humans do than on what the chimpanzees do themselves. Once there is super intelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the super intelligence does. Think about it. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. The machines will then be better at inventing than we are. And they will be doing so on digital timescales. What this means is basically a telescoping of the future. Think of all the crazy technologies that you could have imagined maybe humans could have developed in the fullness of time. So cures for aging, space colonization, self-replicating nanobots or uploading of minds into computers. All kinds of science fiction stuff that's nevertheless consistent with the laws of physics. All of this a super intelligence could develop and possibly quite rapidly. Now, a super intelligence with such technological maturity would be extremely powerful. And at least in some scenarios, it would be able to get what it wants. We would then have a future that would be shaped by the preferences of this AI. Now, a good question is, what are those preferences? Here it gets tricky. To make any headway with this, we must first of all avoid anthropomorphizing. This is uh, ironic because every newspaper article about the future of AI has a picture of this. And so I think what we need to do is to conceive of the issue more abstractly, not in terms of vivid Hollywood scenarios. We need to think of intelligence as an optimization process, a process that steers the future into a particular set of configurations. A super intelligence is a really strong optimization process. It's extremely good at using available means to achieve a state in which its goal is realized. There is no necessary connection between being highly intelligent in this sense and having an objective that we humans find worthwhile or meaningful. Suppose we give an AI the goal to make humans smile. When the AI is weak, it performs useful or amusing actions that cause its user to smile. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that there is a more effective way to achieve this goal. Take control of the world and like, stick electrodes into the facial muscles of humans to cause constant beaming rings. Take another example. Suppose we give an AI the goal to solve a difficult mathematical problem. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that the most effective way to get the solution to this problem is by transforming the planet into a giant computer so as to increase its thinking capacity. And notice that this gives the AIs an instrumental reason to do things to us that we might not approve of human beings in this model are threats. We could prevent the mathematical problem from being solved. Now, of course, presumably things won't go wrong in these particular ways. Right? These are cartoon examples. But the general point here is important. If you create a really powerful optimization process to maximize for objective X, you better make sure that your definition of X incorporates everything you care about. This, this is a lesson that's also taught in many a myth. Um, King Midas wishes that everything it touches be turned into gold. It touches his daughter, she turns into gold. It touches his food, it turns into gold. This could become practically irrelevant, not just as a metaphor for greed, but as an illustration of what happens if you create a powerful optimization process and give it a misconceived or poorly specified goal. Now you might say, well, like, if a computer starts sticking electrodes into people's faces, like, we just shut it off. A, this is not necessarily so easy to do if we grown dependent on the system, like where is the off switch to the internet? B, why haven't 
the chimpanzees flick the off switch to humanity? Or the Neanderthals? Like, they certainly have reason. We have an off switch, for example, right here. Uh, the reason is that we are an intelligent adversary. We can anticipate threats and plan around them, but so could a super intelligent idea. It would be much better at that than we are. Point is, we should not be confident uh, that we have this under control here. We could try to make our job a little bit easier by, say, putting the AI in a box, like a secure software environment, virtual reality simulation from which it cannot escape. But how confident could we be that the AI couldn't find a bug? Like, given that we are the human hackers find bugs all the time, I'd say probably not very confident. All right, so we like disconnect the Ethernet cable to create an error gap. But again, like merely human hackers routinely transgress error gaps using social engineering. Like right now, as I speak, I'm sure there is some employee out there somewhere who's being taught into handing out her accounting sense by somebody who claimed to be from the IT department. Uh, more creative scenarios are also possible. Like if you're the AI, you can imagine like wiggling electrodes around in your internal circuitry to create radio waves that you can use to communicate. Or maybe you could pretend to malfunction and then when the programmers open you up to see what went wrong with you, they look at the source code, bam, the manipulation can take place. Or it could maybe output the blueprint to really nifty technology and when we implement it, it has some surreptitious side effect that the uh, AI had planned. The point here is that we should not be confident in our ability to keep a super intelligent genie locked up in its bottle forever. Sooner or later, it will out. I believe that the answer here is to figure out how to create super intelligent AI such that even if, when, it escapes, it is still safe because it is fundamentally on our side, because it shares our values. I see no way around this difficult problem. Now, I'm actually fairly optimistic that this problem can be solved. Like, we wouldn't have to try to write down a long list of everything we care about, or, or worse yet, spell it out in some computer language like C++ or Python. That, that would be a task beyond hopeless. Instead, we would create an AI that uses this intelligence to learn what we value. And this motivation system is constructed in such a way that it is uh, motivated to pursue our values or to perform actions that it predicts that we would have approved of. We would thus leverage its intelligence as much as possible to solve the problem of value loading. This can happen, and the outcome could be very good for humanity. But it doesn't happen automatically. The initial conditions for the intelligent explosion might need to be set up in just the right way if we are to have a controlled detonation. The values that the AI has needs to match ours, not just in the familiar context, like where we can easily check how the AI behaves, but also in all novel contexts that the AI might encounter in the indefinite future. And there are also some other esoteric issues that will need to be solved, sorted out, the exact details of its decision theory, how to deal with logical uncertainty, and so forth. So the technical problems that need to be solved to make this work look quite difficult. Not as difficult as making a super intelligent AI, but fairly difficult. Here's the worry. Making super intelligent AI is a really hard challenge. Making super intelligent AI that is safe involves some additional challenge on top of that. The risk is that somebody figures out how to crack the first challenge without also having cracked the additional challenge of ensuring perfect safety. So I think that um, we should work out the solution to the control problem in advance so that we have it available by the time it is needed. Now it might be that we cannot solve the entire control problem in advance because maybe some element can only be put in place once we know the details of the architecture where it will be implemented. But the more of the control problem that we solve in advance, the better the odds that the transition to the machine intelligence era will go well. This, um, this to me looks like a thing that is well worth doing. And I mean, I could imagine that if uh, things 
things turn out okay, and that people a million years from now look back at this century, and it might well be that they say that the one thing we did that really mattered was to get this thing right. Thank you. Yes. 
extracted that actually classify us according to subsets of data. Data which we might not be even aware. I'm not aware that I'm moving in a certain way in my hands, but the pattern can spot it and act accordingly. I prefer to talk in terms of classified society. What is the classified society? It's basically that our environment, our decision making environment, is permanently shaped and reshaped uh, by this flow of information. Uh, to think in clear terms, uh, all our search of the web are just not objective search, but are personalized results. So we move, we do a search, and the results I am getting or you are getting are different because they are personalized what the algorithm, the pattern, think, believes that is more suitable for me or for you. So our contextual decision-making environment is continuously changing and altered in this uh, change. So classify normally meant uh, to uh, arrange in the memory and Google has clearly changed it. And it's just an example. Classify arranging people or things. Never before was used for people that just classify uh, in categories according to shared qualities or characteristics. And uh, these shared qualities or characteristics, which are gathered, which are inferred, uh, may not entirely correspond to what we think we are. And uh, sometimes they even priority. And even in the classified society, something more tricky, if you want to say. We are used to a uh, more stable and less dynamic classification. Uh, white man, white woman, black man, black woman. And over time, we have thought that some of them were too discriminatory. So they were not acceptable in legal or ethical terms. It took a number of years. But we are living
which I guess and I hope uh, the frontiers we want to reach. So in the classified society, in this uh, way, the way in which our economy has been, is being shaped thanks to technologies doing marvelous things. And I'm not saying that all this is wrong, but I'm trying to stress one point, that is, we are in a moment in time, a moment in the development of the economy and technology, in which I, our real life identities are becoming less important, to a large extent, even irrelevant. And this irrelevance is strictly related to the fact that all the products and services we receive are contributing to shape our environment, and a specific environment, our decision-making environment. So we are at the point in which we have to decide whether or not it is legally permissible or ethically acceptable and to what extent a withdrawal of information. So the ranking, the results which have been taken away from your search, uh, to what extent this is something we do want? And to what extent withdrawing information, reducing, filtering information or results or possibilities or alternatives or suggestions somehow is reaching a point in which is too much altering, redefining our decision making context. Uh, it's how to draw the border between the marvelous results of taking away of the noise in the search to remain in the temple and to not receive any further information on that. Well, almost 25 years ago or even more, there was this picture uh, in a paper, and the idea was on the internet, nobody knows you are the dog. Well, with hindsight, we might begin to think that certainly on the internet, nobody knows you are the dog. But it might be relevant are treated like a dog, despite the fact you might be the owner, you might not be the owner of a specific kind of dog. And this might be relevant if your decision-making context is shaped by that. Well, I think these are frontiers words to be explored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 